The urgency and visibility of cutting the nation's dependency on carbon-based fuels ebbs and flows with the price of oil. But energy independence is about more than keeping gasoline prices low. Currently, 80% of U.S. energy needs are met by carbon-based fuels. That has direct implications for national security, environmental sustainability, and economic viability. The U.S. spent $460 billion to import oil in 2008. That's two-thirds of America's trade deficit, which may be a serious drag on long-term growth. The United States imports 60% of its petroleum, much from OPEC countries. The reliance on imported petroleum, especially from unstable and potentially hostile parts of the world, could undermine security and economic interests. That point was driven home last December. Europe receives 80% of its natural gas from Russia via Ukraine pipelines. But a pricing dispute between those two countries resulted in Russia cutting off supplies to the Ukraine and left Europe partially in the dark and cold. One strategy, lifting restrictions on domestic drilling in places such as Alaska, may ease the reliance on foreign oil, but slow the nation's conversion from carbon-based energy and in the long run contribute to climate change. U.S. energy consumption accounts for 75% of human CO2 emissions, the main contributor to global climate change. The IPCC, an intergovernmental panel, notes that changes in climate now affect physical and biological systems on every continent. From disease to extremes in weather, famine, even species extinction. But how does the nation end its reliance on carbon-based fuels? And should it? Most people point to alternative sources of energy as the answer, including nuclear power. It is a relatively cheap and clean fuel source. However, no new nuclear facilities have been built since the Three Mile Island accident in 1978. Issues of safety, radioactive waste disposal, and the fear of nuclear proliferation have stymied its development. Renewable energy sources, wind, solar, hydropower, geothermal, and biomass have their own drawbacks and trade-offs, including how to get solar power from the desert and wind power from the plains to the urban areas that need them. President Obama has allocated more than $70 billion in spending and tax credits for renewables, but none of them alone is the silver bullet. With this patchwork of energy sources, many people have advocated for a national energy policy in which the government would provide a comprehensive plan, including fuel standards, green building legislation, and subsidies for renewable energy sources. Others want to see as little government intervention as possible, setting a carbon tax and then stepping out of the way, or a cap-and-trade program in which the government sets emissions caps that can be traded on an open market. Still others say just let the free market sort out the winners and losers. And finally, there is our individual energy consumption. The cheapest, cleanest energy is the energy not used, a point highlighted by environmental activist and former Vice President Al Gore and through public awareness campaigns led by the younger generations. But the bottom line is that those efforts alone are unlikely to provide change at the scale that's needed.